Welcome to another episode of the Game Changers podcast, where we shine the spotlight on the great people we have in this industry, especially those who are going through some sort of career transition or have recently been doing so. And today I have another great guest uh, that I'm super happy to have the chance to talk to. It's Henrik, and I would like to hand it over to him right away for an introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Lars, for having me on your wonderful podcast. I've seen a couple of episodes so far, and it's looking really good. Thank good you. Good people on there, and uh, it's a good format, so congratulations on that. Um, my background is an, a strange one. Uh, I've been a programmer in games and graphics for, for about 25 years. I started in 94 with a big TV show here in Sweden, uh, making video games for, for a TV show that's unusual, but uh, it was an unusual time. It was called Bingo Lotto, and I believe that even you've seen it in some areas in Germany as well. Um, I, I then moved on to do uh, programming in graphics. Uh, so I did. Um, I, went, I went outside the industry, and then I came back into the games industry again. Uh, I worked at Ionstorm in Dallas for uh, some time, almost two years, uh, together with Tom Hall and, and uh, John Romero, of course, of that infamous time in the, in the game industry. Um, uh, the history of the games industry. Uh, and then I've, ever since then, I've been working on all kinds of games, small games, big games, uh, good games, bad games. I've been pretty much everywhere. And until 2018, I was working in a technical capacity. In 2018, I started working with uh, the game investment company, Goodbye Kansas Game Invest, which later became Embrace, uh, the Embracer division, Amplifier Game Invest. Uh, and there I worked until um, until uh, 2013, uh, 2023. Years are difficult. Uh, 2023, uh, when Embracer uh, got into a bit of a wobbly state and uh, some layoffs happened. Um, but I've been working with uh, independent studios quite a bit, uh, both as an investor, trying to find the right teams for us to invest in, but also with the teams that we have already invested in, uh, aiding with a little bit of, of everything, uh, mostly around technical solutions and problems they've face, been facing. And now, uh, to round off this very long introduction, I'm running my own company. It's called Rad Givery, which basically sounds like a bakery for advice uh, <laughs> in Swedish. And it's a, uh, I'm working with investors and in uh, incubators, tech companies, everyone who works with the games industry to support the game developers themselves. Sounds great. I mean, it's a it's a really interesting journey that you've had. Uh, and by the way, I haven't seen Bingo Lotto here in Germany. Maybe it was called differently. I, I don't know. But, uh... Uh, it, it was very small, but I think that it was part of the uh, North uh, Reinhold. Ah, I can't remember the name. Uh, NRW. It's called something, and I can't I pronounce okay. it. Yeah. Um, it was a small local state-owned uh, lottery TV show from the... Uh, mid 90s i think but it's it's great that you still you know kept the connection to games and uh, you know came back to the industry afterwards so you've seen quite a few games as you talked about uh i'm not going to ask you by the way what the worst game where you said like you also worked on some bad games so you know we gotta we cannot go into the details i can uh, i can do that that's that's not a problem for me uh, let's let's jump on that real quick uh, all right Up to i you. worked on the the i don't i don't think it was this bad but uh the Last Need for Speed title I worked on, uh, Need, uh, Need for Speed Payback, it got mm. the Rock Paper Shotgun uh, review. Uh, the new Need for Speed is worse than shitting your pants. Oh so, my <laughs> um, and you know, Rock Paper Shotgun, they always try to be, you know, make headlines and get That's some clickbaity yeah. titles to their Twitter posts and stuff. Uh, but the game was not a giant success. Uh, let, let's say that. Um, could have been better. Uh, and uh, we, we of course, we had, it was in the time of uh, loot boxes and things, so we had, of course, some of that. And uh, the, game, the game could have been better, no doubt about it. So we'll dive into the, the better games uh, in a moment. But if you've seen uh, some of the other episodes here, then you know I always ask the almost infamous question about uh, characters in video games. So uh, you've worked on so many, you've played so many. Uh, is there any character in those video games that stood out to you in a way that you would love to have a conversation with that character? And, and if so, like, what would you talk about? I, I, I kind of tried to, I tried to prepare for this question, and it's such a... Such an odd one because the the characters in video games tend to be uh, caricatures of of themselves, basically. Mm. So, um, 
there are many, many really cool uh, people who, who basically, uh, or characters who, who have been uh, made, made a very lasting impression, but I don't think I would like to meet them for dinner. There, like, there is the, uh, just like in, in, in a movie, you think like, oh, Reservoir Dogs, to just bring up one very old one. It's so like, oh, it's a great character cast, and I really don't want to meet any one of them. Like, they're, they're all terrible people. Like, uh, we, I don't want to meet any one of them. Uh, and but I'm trying to to figure out and and um, characters that have an interesting hook uh, in themselves um, tend to tend to um, not st- interesting people are not necessarily <laughs> this is this is very strange the people who tend to be nice tend to be the people that you don't necessarily remember. The the characters that you remember from video games are usually the the all out blatant crazy folks, uh, and I'm I'm not sure I would I would want to to hang out with anyone of those. But there is there is a, a character that stood out, and I've, I've been playing a lot of Pathfinder, Path, uh, Wrath of the Righteous, and there is a queen in the last in, in this game. Uh, I think her name is Gallifrey, uh, and she's been alive for eight hundred years or something. It's it's a it's a strange story in a strange world, and she seems kind of put together and and fair. You know, she's been regaining, you know, been queening for quite some time, uh, and I think that would be one of the favorite characters I'd like to know more about. Uh, not necessarily because she has the most interesting philosophies or or, but just a perspective that would be interesting to to listen to. Cool. I mean, and you're right to to some extent with the the you know characters in video games uh, being you know slightly crazy sometimes <laughs> so yeah it could be leading to uh, interesting get togethers if we yeah uh, th- there's a there's a halfling in one of the older Baldur's gate games and he's one of his call signs is uh, or one of his barks is uh, here comes halfling death he shouts gleefully when he jumps into 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 battle and i mean that's funny that's quirky that's rememberable it's not necessarily the guy i want to take to dinner right or just Hang out. So. Yeah. All right, then uh, let's move away from the from the characters topic more to uh, games uh, in the, in the past. And uh, I was wondering, are there any games uh, you already worked on quite a few? But are there any games that you would have loved to work on? Maybe not necessarily the ones that uh, you um, you know worked on already, but uh, like big titles or even small titles that you felt like are beautiful and uh, you would have uh, loved to be a part of this. And once again, I'm going to be very boring because my, <laughs> my love for video games is trumped by the, my love for, for game developers. So when, when I work at a game studio, my, the things that make me happy is usually to, to work with the teams that, that are the people who make the games. So I, as a technical developer, I, I like, I'm always happiest when I can make the performance going, go better or if I can add new features to make, the, make it easier to make the game for the developers who, who do them. So I'm very focused on teams, not necessarily as much the games they work on, but on teams. And uh, the, the pride I take in releasing a, a, a game is, is usually more uh, around uh, the people I've worked with and having enjoyed working with them rather than like, oh, I, I, I released, uh, you know, I, I, if I worked on, on um, Gears of War or, or uh, God of War Fair or enough, something yeah. like that. But uh, with that being said, I would have been uh, would have loved to be part of the the God of War development cycle, basically because I know the the writers for the God of, the new God of War series, uh, Richie Gobert and uh, Matt San- uh, Sofas, who are uh, great people, and they've been working very closely with with the um, Corey Barlow uh, over the years with with these the new um, revamp of of uh, uh, God of War, and I would have loved to work with them again. So, so that is definitely one of those titles. So and then, of course, I... uh, you know, uh, from a purely exhilar- hil- what do you call it? exhilaratingly interesting way thing to do is would be being like a title like Valheim, who gets you work for, so, for mm. with such a small team for such a long time, and it just explodes when when you when you release it. And that must have been a, must be an absolutely fantastic feeling. So, I'm going to say God of War and Valheim for two very different reasons. I mean, the Valheim team, you probably would have uh, increased by 33% or something if you well, were in the, uh, team, the we, team. Yeah, so yeah I mean, it's, it's a very, very small team. And 
I would have been contributing to the bloat, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> in a way, in, a, in that sense. So I'm going to help you a little bit with the next question. Usually I ask about, uh, you know, what game you would like to revisit and re-experience if you had completely forgotten it. But now, since you said that you really enjoy working with teams, uh, I'm going to ask about what kind of team experience, so what kind of project that you worked with a team would you love to forget just to re-experience again because it was a highlight of your career? Uh, oh, that is that is interesting. Well, I I think I would like if we, if I could do the the way we started out out with the Goodbye Kansas again. Uh, I, I would have loved to just do that again because that was a very very interesting time. And if I especially if I could bring the the knowledge that we kind of all had have now uh, back five six years and kind of restart that, that would have been absolutely fantastic. We had a very small team. We had a lot of fun. We had. Uh, we're meeting with a lot of great game developers and trying to uh, trying to uh, our, to do our best to to invest in them. Um, How much of that knowledge that you uh, gained uh, in the past couple of years of being part of Goodbye Kansas and Amplifier uh, Game Invest, obviously, uh, can you now apply to Red Givery and what you do there? I think quite a lot. Uh, I think that the the understanding of the games industry as a business have uh, got gotten a lot stronger in my mind, um, and also trying to ensure that. People are uh, aligning more when we start. The product starts out. Basically, we had do a handshake on. Uh, I would have would have liked it if we had been a little bit better at doing a handshake early on and saying, "This is the kind of decisions that we're going to do together. These are the things that you can do yourself. Uh, these these are the areas where you don't that we both know that you don't have expertise. Let's bring in someone uh, who who knows." This, this domain and, and to find those experts. Um, I think that that's something that uh, slightly less, um, I don't want to say bullshit about it, but the, 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 the fluff, trying to, I, I've been, become better to recognize fluff, I think, and trying to become a little bit harder at uh, maybe taking those, the uncomfortable decisions that still have to be done in order to get uh, game design and game product out the door. Um, looking a little bit more towards the product end rather than the game, so to speak. Uh, how can this be marketed? How can how can we um, position this uh, game um, rather than like how do you jump? How do you shoot? Like the the more gameplay aspects. So I came from a technical background and I started into a new role of investment and, and working with uh, smaller teams. And that's something that I've uh, learned quite a bit. And I, I'm now in Rad Gibri, I have a very, like a helicopter perspective of the games industry in a way that I didn't have before. And that right. will be very, very useful. I like the recognized fluff term. You know, I'm probably going to use it in the, in well, the future because it's, well, I mean, it's true. There has to be a certain amount of fluff. And I, like the, the creative process is anything but fluff. Like if you're really creative, you, you are in, a, in the zone of, of developing things and it's not fluffy. But there is an aspect of of uh, loving your own design a little bit too much that can become yeah. a, a kind of fluff that is uh, can be dangerous for for a, pro a project. And, and I think we've all seen that countless times where uh, teams got very emotionally attached to what they were working on, uh, and it was a, a game vision they had. It was their baby, um, and uh, then when you had to talk about the business side of things, the product side of things, turning that that game vision into a product and ultimately finding people to to play it. That's where it can sometimes become tricky. So I, I do <laughs> agree with you that, you know, realizing that there is a bit of uh, fluff or a little bit of a uh, maybe um, an illusion that everything is going to be fine, you know, is sometimes very helpful to make even better games and better products if you realize it early on and try to find, you know, countermeasures or be more clear about what you want to have in the market later on. Absolutely. And I mean, every if you try to take any parent and tell them that you have to sell their baby, that they have to sell their baby, uh, it's not going to go over well. Any, anyone who's in, very much in love with, with their creation is going to have a hard time uh, productifying or, or, uh, or not. Uh, it, it, takes, it takes a work to get over that going Absolutely. from the, 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 the baby that you care for, your, your golden idea, uh, and make it into something that, you know, Will be, will have mass market appeal. It's not necessarily uh, you're not necessarily looking to sell you know 10 million copies, but at least to to look at the financial side and say yes, this is indeed the um, 
the, the decisions we have to take in order to be able to sell the product to a larger market because we want to sell the product because we want to make the next game, not just this one, right? Yeah, and it's not necessarily the same skill set from my experience. Uh, making a great game and making a great product can sometimes be two different things. Um, and so you, you need to rely on people that have trust in you and support you, but at the same time, you know, know about how to actually turn it into something that is then uh, ready for for the players out there. So it's Very rare that you have like this, the both skills in the same uh, team or the same people. Yeah, especially in teams who are making their first game, and uh, that's the that's the area where I like to to the people that I care for the most tend to be the people who are enthusiastic uh, beginners, so to speak. They're mm -hmm. making their first title; they want to get it as good as possible, and uh, uh, with some years in in the industry behind me, almost thirty now, I I can start to see where people are. Uh, making the same mistakes. And we uh, had a saying at, at Amplify, we want people to make new mistakes. So our job is to make sure mm -hmm. that the, the old mistakes are not being done again, uh, because those we're supposed to recognize. At least if, the, if we are going to make mistakes, let's make sure that we make new mistakes um, that, we, that none of us have seen before. So at least we can't really, uh, we're not redoing things we already know, basically. Now, I like that attitude, um, and I've also realized over the past couple of years that you make quite a big impact if you help young teams uh, whose first or second project that is to, like you said, avoid those old mistakes and uh, maybe even help them in a positive way, find the new ones to make um, and help them to, you know, find the countermeasures to, uh, you know, them not make them too big. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, there's also an amount of humble pie that needs to be uh, considered, right? The, even though we've seen a lot of stuff, uh, both you and me, we've been around for quite some time, but we, what we think are good solutions might not end up being good. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we make mistakes. We're all, we're all, uh, it's very hard to say that you have an absolute truth uh, to anything in, on a, in a shifting game market, but at least there are some things that I believe that the, this experience can, can help uh, teams with. We're talking about your experience and the journey you've uh, had a little bit more. Did you have any point in time where you had one of those eureka moments where you felt like, ah, oh, now I see things a bit differently? Was there any any kind of pivotal moment um, that that changed your perspectives? Um, I've had a couple of those since I'm uh, since again I'm very old. I've had a couple of those. You're not that uh, old, by the way. I, should, I have to say, you know, maybe uh, but, older than me, but, but still. yeah. But but I'd, I'd like to say that. Uh, at one point, uh, around 2000, I think, six or seven, um, I had stumbled upon uh, an education that I went to. Um, it was it's basically uh, media media studies. I did a semester of media studies at the university just to get you know something new into my head, and um, I kind of stumbled upon the realization that people are more interesting than than computers and I, up until that point i was kind of the classic programmer very techy very very um you know uh, i want to learn about the cache memory i don't necessarily need to hear about your memories from your vacation right mm. um so uh, and once i kind of made that eureka moment i i really enjoyed talking about communication i, I really enjoyed talking about presentation skills things that go into uh, that are very applicable now when it comes to, to people are pitching their games, they're talking to investors, they want to make a good impression. And I see many teams failing because they are too focused on uh, themselves. They, they, uh, they talk about things that they like uh, to talk about and not what the, the uh, recipient uh, needs to hear or wants to hear. Um, so, so the, that's that's one uh, eureka moment. I also had a re eureka moment when I realized why I was enjoying programming. Um, because quite frankly, I don't enjoy programming as a programmer. That sounds strange, but I I, I love having written something. Uh, I don't love actually sitting there doing it. So uh, and the, the the moment I hand over something to the designer or the artist or or whomever who is who's now able to make the game better, make the game faster, make the game stop crashing, all those things. I enjoyed that part more than I enjoy mm -hmm. um, the actual programming of stuff. And this is the universal sign of programming, by the way. Just click the click. Uh, so um, 
so when I, I realized that I'm being driven by um, by uh, this passion of helping others make their games, I realized I don't have to program to do that. So that was the realization that came when I started working for um, Goodbye Kansas Game Invest, which became Amplify Game Invest. Uh, I can help people make their games without having to program stuff. So uh, I can help them with investment. I can help them with technical connections, to with recommendations, with with guides, with all all these things that are nece or necessary or help them without me sitting there and you know trying to get some C C plus plus code to cast the pointer to a certain type in order to solve some ridiculous data lookup issue. Like all that stuff is just I don't I don't love it. So. So that, that's 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 two Eureka moments that happened with about a decade um, separation in time. So we got a bonus moment in this episode here. Thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> so uh, it reminds me a little bit of my own uh, journey, to be honest, because I am a techie at heart, uh, more on the hardware side, not so much on the on the programming side. But uh, I also felt like if I want to be in games, you know, I have to program and I and I have to do that. And uh, I quickly came to the realization, no, it might be harder to get into the industry if you don't bring those skills sometimes. Um, but uh, I do feel there's a credible value that uh, you know all of us can add, even if we don't program. But it's sometimes good to at least know how it works and uh, and have the background uh, you know, to be part of a conversation and better understand what's, what's going on. Oh, absolutely. And in my current role, I'm helped immensely by my decades of programming. Like I, I can talk to developers. I don't, I can talk to any, anyone involved now in the, in the entire game development process except for animators because i just i just don't i don't talk animation it's <laughs> a, it's not it doesn't work but anyone else uh, i can talk to her. i can talk to the sound guys uh, i can talk to to qa i can talk to the, the finance people now so so i'm very very much being helped by having this kind of diverse uh, or it's not a diverse background it's not because it's all it's all been tech but um the the work in tech has uh, allowed me to to learn to talk to yeah. all the developers, basically. So, um, if we look at a bit away from actual like specific games and uh, and uh, the, the the journey that you've had so far, more into the current situation of the industry, uh, all the challenges that we see right now, whether it's in actual game development, of course, in the wider industry, when it comes to like uh, all the layoffs and everything that that's happening, uh, and access to capital and so on. Is there any particular challenge that you see right now or a set of challenges that you feel, you know, very strongly about and that you would like to tackle somehow personally or be a part of and and how would you go about it? Oh, yeah, well, I I mean, what we're seeing right now is the I uh, hopefully the end tail of this horrific year uh, 2023. Like there's there's been the I just saw Thunderful laying off twenty percent of the companies that came out to date. So I mean, it, it's a... unfortunately we're already like uh, into the thousands uh, in this year, as far as I uh, recall. There were quite a few yeah. news in the first uh, couple of days in twenty twenty four already, yeah. you know, announcing layoffs and so on. So, so there is uh, the challenge is, of course, uh, that I can't solve is to get everyone who who has to leave uh, to to get new jobs. Like of I would, would love to be able to do that. I don't know how I would do that. I. I don't have that magic wand, unfortunately. Uh, and the same same way, uh, something that I try to do, but I, I mean, obviously can't do, can't solve, uh, is is uh, our ongoing lack of diversity uh, and inclusion, mm -hmm. which is all, always going to be even worse now uh, in in the in the time of of mass layoffs, because the people who uh, who get laid off are usually the ones that have recently come into the studios. So the the uh, and that means that the the uh, the gains of uh, the last couple of years when it comes to to uh, more women in games or or with a, people with more uh, with a more broad background. Uh, I don't have numbers on this, but I'm assuming that the, the people who get to stay are the ones that have been in the games industry or the the studios for a longer time. I would support the hypothesis, um, but I'm also not curious about the numbers. I haven't looked it up yet. Uh, like uh, what the you know what the groups are that have been affected the most by this, but I it sounds reasonable, uh, which is that would also be my assumption. Uh, but it's probably worth you know looking into that. So I yeah, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm just pulling numbers out of my ass basically because I'm just you know it, it's but it's, I'm assuming things here. Uh, we had a in the last report we got from the Swedish games uh, games industry uh, organization. 
um, they said that we had 44% women join of the people who joined the industry uh, last year. We had a 44% uh, 44% of them were women or not non male. I think. Um, and if that is a good, that's that's a big gain. Uh, but if if a very large portion of those are being laid off this year, then the gain is you know reversed. So so the and that's probably one of those uh, very very annoying uh, things that we will uh, end up seeing once the the dust settles and people can do actual studies, is that we have lost some of the uh, diversity and inclusion efforts, uh, not only by people being laid off, but who who have been laid off as well. Yeah, and I think um, it's something we can only tackle together as an as an industry and as people that uh, you know understand it makes a difference. We've had it in a couple other episodes of the podcast as well that we talked about it. And um, you know, I'm a strong advocate of very diverse teams, and, yeah, and sometimes yeah. it's, it's hard work to get you know those teams together. And then if they fall apart because of uh, measures that have to be taken, uh, you know, to keep studios going, or maybe not not even keep them going, but uh, you know, stay financially uh, healthy, then um, this hurts quite a bit. But it's uh, something we can only uh, do all of us uh, together i think you know if we absolutely. want to really change this absolutely and i think that there is work for uh, for like for example you've been very much involved with game in in uh, in germany i've been involved in the swedish games industry organization uh, this is something that those these organizations probably can do a little bit extra work on now in these hard times so yeah, um, it's true we will have to see uh, but so anything, but of course, I mean, I can't solve it. I can just point to it and say we need to do <laughs> do work here, and and of course, do my my share of the lifting to make it yes, exactly. I think that's that's about doing our part, uh, you know, our share and all of that. Uh, nobody has a magic wand or yeah, uh, exactly. you know or a crystal yeah. ball to see what's what's happening. Um, so we need to just work on the things that we can actually influence. And speaking of a crystal ball, um, I mean, maybe you have a little bit of your own personal crystal ball looking into the future, your own future. So uh, I'm wondering to kind of conclude this segment, um, what are your dreams and aspirations going forward? I mean, now you have your own company with Red Givery. Um, uh, you, you work with uh, diverse teams out there uh, to support them. Um, is that your dream role or is there even more that you have in mind? Um I, I would say that this is my dream role, but uh, I'm still struggling a little bit to get uh, fully um, get all get all my uh, invoices lined up. So, so the it, it is my dream role if I can get paid properly. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm doing quite all right, and it's not a it's not a problem. But starting my own company was uh, slightly harder than I was uh, envisioning. Uh, but I very much enjoy it. I think this is a dream type of role. Uh, and if I can find the right teams to work with as well and supporting the right organizations, the right investors, etc., uh, I think that will become absolutely my dream dream role. But then again, who knows? In 2025, maybe I will start, you know, lining up, trying to find regular employment again. We'll see. It's going to be an interesting year, this for sure. One way or the other, I think you add a lot of value to this industry, and it's great to have you as a part of it. Uh, so, thank you, thank sure. you very much, Lars. So, uh, Henrik, I want to thank you so much uh, for being part of today's episode. Uh, it was fun talking to you about all those topics, uh, and I wish you nothing but the best uh, for your own company or whatever comes beyond. Thanks for being a part of this. Thanks to everybody for listening or watching this episode, uh, and stay tuned for the next ones to come. Thank you so much. It's been great.